What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. You know, Andrew, I like to point out some of the past guests I've had. I had uh, Rudy Mara, and especially in e-commerce, because, you know, if we, I will properly introduce you, Andrew, but your e-commerce fuel podcast is awesome. So if you are in e-commerce or thinking about it, check it out. Um, and here's some of the, the past guests I've had who are in e-commerce that are interesting to listen to also. Rudy Marr, who's been helping leading br- and buying brands like Radio Shack, Pier One, Linens and Things. And he talks about how he helps to grow them digitally. Roy Krebs of Natural Stacks, uh, he talks about how he grew the company early on and how influencers like Tim Ferriss and Dave Asprey helped shape the company. I think, Andrew, out of all my intros, that is the best one out of all my intros. And it wasn't the intro of the guest. It was a highlight reel. So if you are the first three or four minutes of it is the best highlight reel I have on any of my, my podcasts. So check it out. Um, top VCs because Andrew, you have, um, e-commerce fuel capital going on, which we'll talk about some of the top VCs I've had on Ellie Wortman, uh, who's introduced me by Craig Weiss in the past year. He talks about how one of his companies hit $5.5 $5.5 billion market cap after its IPO. And another company was acquired for $450 million. And this is, you know, we're talking about COVID times here. Let's see uh, where it is here. It's right there, Ellie Wortman. Um, and before I choose today's guest, uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses connect to their Dream 100 relationships, collaborative partners, um, and we help you run your podcast. That's what we do. We are an easy button for your podcast. And, you know, Andrew, I think the same goes for you. Over the past over decade, I've seen no better way to give to my relationships, have people I admire on and spread the word on what they're doing is having them on my podcast. So uh, check it out. If you've thought about starting a podcast, I think you should. Uh, and you can check out more information at rise25.com. And today's guest, Andrew Udarian, is the founder of e-commerce fuel, which I mentioned. And after a few years in investment banking world, Andrew decided he'd had enough. He's going to quit and start his first e-commerce business. He sold numerous e-commerce stores over the years, which have collectively generated millions of dollars. And he has got experience bootstrapping stores at seven figures, business exits, SEO, community building. Specifically, he's built this amazing community called e-commerce fuel, where you can't e-commerce store owners can help each other grow their stores, but it builds deeper relationships. And Andrew, thanks for joining me. Yeah, of course. Thanks for the kind intro and for having me on. Here's e-commerce field. And they have a great podcast as well. You could check it out. Andrew, I want to talk about um, this note card. Okay. So I heard you talk about a note card and their principles that you really live your life uh, from and probably how you build your community. So I'm wondering if you can share some, if not all, I'll sit here all day and listen to your note card. Okay. What is on this note card? Yes, man, man you do your homework. Um, it's, it's a note card. There's a guy named, uh, I don't know, maybe a year ago, I was listening to an interview with, uh, with someone and they mentioned Zig Ziglar and he was a guy I always heard about. People mentioned kind of these names. You've heard the name, but you don't know what they're doing. I, I love Zig Ziglar. I used to listen to his audio cassette tapes in my car, rise, I think it was rise to the top or something like that. But yeah, yeah. And he's got he's got some good books. And um they're kind of I think you you'd maybe call him an early motivational speaker. And I hate using that term because he's it's it makes him sound really cheap and and kind of, you know, uh not like he has a lot of substance, but he, he really does. And so um, anyway, I got, got interested and in, uh, just checked out one or two of his kind of audiobooks. And I thought they were really good. And one of the things he has is uh, he's mentioned, I can't remember exactly in what phrases he put it, but having a note card that you read and kind of you read through these things every day for some of the ways you want to act or the habits you want to have. So yeah, I'm happy to share um, the ones I have this little note card. It's kind of like right here. Uh, and I'm not perfect about reading it every morning, but a lot of mornings I will. And the ones on there are, I act out of courage and purpose, not fear. I'm always kind and loving to Annie, my wife. I'm patient with my kids. I'm extremely productive with my time to make time for family, friends, and adventures. I refuse to accept having to pick between a rich personal life and business ambitions. 
Um, I put money to work in ways that make me nervous, but not afraid after trusting my instincts. Uh, keep my body in shape at home three times a week. Uh, I'm in bed with a good book by 1030. And again, these are aspirational because I'm thinking about these. And <laughs> I haven't made it to bed with a good book by like, you know, in a week probably. Uh, give my friends and family the benefit of the doubt. I honor God in what I say and do. Uh, and I'll make a recent launch uh, or my work successful and fun through hard work, deep thought and appropriate delegation. So those are, mm. those are kind of the ones that I are love it. There. Is that on e-commerce fuel anywhere? It is not. No, I feel never... like it should be. You should take a picture of it and put it on the site or something I don't, with the values, because really you are leading this community, and and those are your values, right? And you could tell there's family baked in there, there's health baked in there, there's business baked in there, but there's self care baked in there, all those things baked in there. What are the top two hardest for you on that list? Oh, that's a good. I, I would say. Like the patient with the kids during COVID, during virtual schooling. Yeah. Um, sometimes I would need to read that card a couple of times a day. <laughs> I, think, I think every every parent does for sure. I would say the ones that are hardest for me are probably like the exercise one, like keeping my body in shape three times a week. I have a lot of discipline in some things. Uh, physical exertion, especially when I'm pushing up against physical boundaries, unless I'm chasing a ball or there's some kind of competition involved is really difficult for me. I did CrossFit for like three or four months before the pandemic hit and ended up not sticking with it uh, because partially because of COVID shut things down, but also partially because I felt like it was tearing my body apart. I always felt like I was like 80 years old. But the thing I loved about it was the competitive aspect. Like you're in there and I'm super competitive. And so that part, having some kind of competitive force to help push my body was cool. But so I would say that one, the the keeping my myself in shape, I would say the other one is probably, I'd say the other one is probably uh, putting money to work in ways that make me nervous, but not afraid. Hmm. Uh, just because I, I tend to be very risk adverse and it's, there's been like the number of times I've been like, oh, I should have done this or I should have done that. And then I don't take any action on it. And I see Shopify stock go from 30 to a thousand or uh, you know, I see the the plot of land I was thinking about buying double in price in my old Montana neighborhood. Like those kind of things. Yeah, we have just, it's just hard for me. So I think getting over taking more risks, calculated risks, especially when I feel so that's why I kind of came up with that phrase, like do things, make investments that make you nervous, but not afraid. And I feel like that's, you can't make a good investment without being a little nervous about it, because then there's no risk and there's no reward. But if you're afraid, that probably is a signal that Either you haven't thought through some, some, you haven't thought through something well enough, or there's a ton of risk. So, long answer to your question, but those are probably the no. Two. That's that's you know you mentioned two things that you missed out on: a plot of land, a Shopify stock that may have made you nervous of buying. What was something you didn't in the past? It doesn't have to be in the past year, but something that you you realize this is making me really nervous. But you leaned into it and actually it you ended up doing it. Yeah, uh, I think a, a, a number of things. Um, you know, recently it was probably investing more, uh, just investing more into the, the markets. So I bought, like when the when the markets were, you know, falling apart in March, April. I put not nearly as much as I had hoped to, uh, but I put some money in. Then uh, recently did an ECF Capital deal that put a, a good chunk of money into that. That uh, again wouldn't have done it and wouldn't have brought other investors in if I didn't think it was a great opportunity. But it was a good chunk of money and it's, you know, it's, you're never sure how those things are going to end out. Even when you do a lot of diligence and you know, the people, um, bought a house, uh, in Tucson recently, uh, that was a second property. Uh, Bitcoin was another one at one point, bought a little bit of that. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a bunch of different things, but getting better at, 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 uh, trying to make those, those investments. You mentioned e-commerce fuel capital, right? If you're watching the video, um, you can see I'm on e-commerce fuel and I, I want you to talk about a few of the components of e-commerce fuel. Obviously there's the private community aspect. There's the e-commerce capital and there is a podcast. Talk about the e-commerce fuel capital and why you started it and how it works. Yeah. So e-commerce fuel capital is, it's a group of investors led by myself that looks to invest in promising, interesting e-commerce companies. And I started it because I, I tend to see, uh, I tend to get a decent 
number of interesting opportunities that kind of just come across my inbox from seeing store members that community members that want to sell or maybe uh, software companies that I get to talk with early and they're doing interesting things. Um, but yeah, just a lot of different interesting opportunities. And I also know a lot of people, especially in 2021, when interest rates are just, you know, rock bottom that are looking for some interesting, compelling places to put their money in. So I, I kind of thought about those two and thought, Hey, this is an interesting opportunity to marry those two and also be able to invest myself. And so that's, that's kind of how it was born. How can someone get involved in that? Do they have to be, a? uh, cause I know with your community, you are, there's, it's a paid membership, right? It's closed paid membership. If you want to be a part of the community, there's certain qualifications people have to meet. Do the people in the e-commerce field capital have to be a part of the, the membership too? How does it work? Yeah, that's a great question. Right now we've got about, you know, 15, 16 people that are kind of the, the, the core members. And right now it's not publicly open. I don't think I'll ever make it publicly open. I have, especially after this first deal that we did, I think in future deals, I'll definitely uh, consider opening it up to the broader private community. Um, but it will always, it will always stay something that at least at a minimum, you'd have to be a part of the community or, or within my close network to invest in. And I think, I think that's just because just like anything in business, you want to know the people you're investing with and are in business and that you're in business with. And uh, having quality partners and investors is, is, in my opinion, a lot more important than having uh, bigger investors or more of them. So uh, yeah, being a part of the community or just getting on the email list and getting to know me is probably the, one of the best ways to do that. How um, can you talk about the deal, even if you can't name companies, just generally sure. how did it work and what happened? Yeah. So we, we had a, a friend of ours a friend of mine uh, that I have known for seven years um, plus, she's actually one of our, was one of the founding members in e-commerce fuel um, was looking to sell her business. And she called me up to talk about a few things and ask a couple of pieces of advice. And in the process of doing that, I thought, Hey, this is a really interesting business. Um, just had, you know, margins were interesting, good repeat business. It was in the, in the, in the home product space. Uh, it, uh, was primarily on Amazon, which was something I wasn't looking for. But knowing this woman, she just runs an extremely tight ship. And uh, so my confidence uh, that was kind of proven out in due diligence was that she built a very white hat, uh, great review rankings, and that stuff. So we, I ended up, you know, taking a look at it and through a bunch of different uh, kind of conversations, partners uh, with two other people, uh, two other good friends also from e-commerce fuel, uh, that I've known through e-commerce fuel, one that is running the company uh, after we, we just closed on this about two weeks ago. Um, and about a little bit more in the future. I haven't really talked about this publicly a whole lot, but at all. Um, but one of them that is running the kind of the, uh, the business for the first year or so has a lot of deep e-commerce operational expertise. Uh, one of the parties came in also has a ton of e-commerce experience, but he personally guaranteed uh, the note in exchange for, for a chunk of the company. Uh, it was an SBA loan. And then we had an investor pool of about a dozen of us uh, that came in to invest in it. So, and yeah, it's uh, looking for, looking forward to, to improving it, growing it, uh, you know, trying to grow it off Amazon as well. And, and we're pretty excited about it. It makes perfect sense, right? You have all the elements inside your community to really run and grow e-commerce companies. And, and I want you to talk about why do people join e-commerce? fuel the community one of the reasons is for the networking and the people and you we were talking before we hit record and i said what are some interesting stories about relationships reform and you were mentioning another company that exited what happened there yeah it was uh again i can't name the name just out of uh, being courteous to con uh, confidentiality for that, that company but there was a a member who had spent the last you know I don't know, five to 10 years, maybe longer, building a really meaningful eight figure business. Uh, and he was looking to sell. And he actually ended up after talking to some private equity people and some other folks, he ended up selling to somebody inside the community that he'd met at one of our live events at our UCF live event. And so, um, and it worked out really well as someone who has, you know, been a part of multiple transactions where I have known the counterparty, the buyer or the seller. Uh, it just makes the deal so much easier uh, because 80% of your the process is trying to figure out the intentions of the the buyer seller. Do they have good intentions in mind? What aren't they telling me? And if you go in there with an existing relationship, it makes it so much better. So, so that was really cool. I mean, he had a great exit. The other person had a great investment, and 
uh, the process wasn't horrific. So um, yeah, that was a recent one that comes to mind. Why do, why, what are other reasons people join? I, I think, that, you know, I think the, the reasons people join and the reasons people stay, I think are probably different. Uh, the peop reason people join is to be able to tap into what I believe is the world's largest community of seven and eight figure e-commerce brands. Uh, and the hub of and the heart of that is in, in a private forum that we have. So we've got thousands of, of comments, uh, you know, each and every month, uh, if you go in there and, and, you know, ch chat about or ask a question about just about anything, you're going to get an answer from Amazon prime to maybe you have to fire an employee and you're worried about liability to, you know, uh, all of a sudden your container costs and your shipping costs just went through the roof because of COVID and everything else. So how are people getting around that? So I think the immediate, access to knowledge is probably the biggest driver, but people stick around because of the relationships that they make. And even if they're just virtual, um, we're pretty careful about the type of people we curate and uh, let remain members. And I don't say that, it sounds really arrogant the way I say that, but it's a better way to say it is we don't put up with people that are rude or dismissive, dismissive or arrogant or uh, condescending. And uh, I, one of my greatest joys is to be able to, if there's someone who's not a good fit and they're continually just being toxic is to politely show them the door because it just, it makes, it makes for such a better to have the ability to do that and maintain a, a great healthy community where deep relationships and trusting relationships and friendships can thrive. Uh, I think that's uh, probably why people stick around for the yeah. long term. So, I mean, it's all about culture. I mean, in a company, in a community, and if someone tolerates that, then it leads to more people like that or more conversations like that. So I totally get it. And, mm -hmm. and I, you know, it's a great community. I mean, I'm a part of the community. Um, you allowed me in the community. Thank you for that. Um, and most people don't know, it, yeah. Andrew, like my background is, is in biochemistry and as a chiropractor. And, um, I started, um, you know, supplements like 10 years ago, like when most people were not doing anything and, um, someone told me about your community and and so it's it's great i mean the people are super nice super friendly i need to go in it more it reminded me when i was doing research today like i need to just go in it more and and it's you only get what you put in so it's like about participating and going in and and engaging um as well and it's people are super active and, and really engage you know engage with other people and help really are there to help other people which is what a community is there for um and you know one of the, I want to talk about popular threads. What you have found is popular threads because you've been doing this for a long time. And I, when I was watching an interview with you yesterday that was from, I think, 2014 or 2015, even. And you said one of the, the key pieces of advice that you've seen in the group was about pricing. And talk about that and, and what were some results because of that. I, a thread that pops up recently is someone who was running a, or really a case study. That's one of the things, one of the things too, we, one of our core values is reciprocity. So for all our new members, we, we require that within 30 days, they kind of write and post a case study to contribute something to the, the kind of the broader group. And um, so we get a lot of great case studies in the community. A big thread that somebody wrote up a couple, maybe a year and a half ago at this point was about how they took their business and focused more on profitability versus revenue. And they shrunk their business in some senses, but they also raised the prices quite a bit. And I've experienced this in numerous businesses uh, on multiple occasions where people, entrepreneurs have this innate terror of raising prices because we feel like if, I think there's an innate terror always kind of low level in the lizard brain for entrepreneurs that everything is gonna fall apart and the wheels are gonna come off the bus and you're just, going to be left with nothing. I, I think at least a lot of people have that. I think I know I do it sometimes. And so uh, you think about raising prices and that kicks into overdrive, like my revenue and my sales are going to just dry up. Um, but usually in my experience and a lot of other people's experience, especially if you do it in a smart way, raising prices is, is hands down one of the best things you can do for your business. There's no other lever in your business that you can pull that will have as dramatic and as quick of a impact on the bottom line is raising prices. And so that was that was played out in this case study. This uh, this member shared uh, it's, you know, and a lot of the advice that people shared about that as well was one of two things. I think there was a big thread that was going on it. The biggest thing was most people who did raise prices did not regret it. It ended up being a huge benefit for their business, both from the increased margin, but also from less uh, the, the 
you know, the decreased work that was required to generate those those sales. Uh, and then the few people that raised prices and regretted it, they shared how they raised prices. It, it, it didn't improve their profitability. And so they reverted them and went back to life and nobody stormed their business and nobody, you know, <laughs> you know, shame them on no social harm, media. No harm, no foul, right? It was not a big deal. So I think, yeah, raising prices, at least testing pricing is probably the biggest thing people overlook and it's huge. What's another popular thread that sticks out over the years that, I don't know, it doesn't have to be, it could have surprised you, could have not, but because you really see what people are really wanting and talking about from the inside view, right? What's another popular thread that you saw that, you know, had a lot of people engaging with it because it it hit a chord inside the community. Yeah, I think so. I'm looking at some just kind of on the private side, uh, our all time most recent threads. Michael Jackness, who's uh, the man behind one of the men behind uh, Ecom Crew, he did a great case study on selling his business that was uh, super popular. Um, we had a uh, a thread I rolled out where. We said that uh, to be a member, you had to contribute at least uh, somewhat every year. Otherwise, you wouldn't couldn't can, couldn't remain a, a, a member. Just because again, back to our core value about reciprocity, and that was really popular. One member who hit the million dollar mark, uh, kind of a little bit earlier in our our life when uh, when we had some smaller brands in there, and still do have some great smaller brands, and just that was super popular. Um, what else? Case studies on selling businesses. Um, some of the threads are really interesting. That. Uh, are have nothing to do with e-commerce. We had one that talked about uh, addiction recently, and some people being really, some people really being open and vulnerable and uh, sharing their their struggles with that uh, and how they were able to overcome or, or deal with those things. Um, people leaving Amazon. Uh, sometimes people talking about stuff like you know, golf. Uh, what people love to talk about their cars, what kind of cars they drive. It's a mix of like there's all these random things in there too about just as not as just as much. Lots of interesting lifestyle ones as well as e-commerce, but it's all over the board. I want to talk early on, Andrew, of starting e-commerce fuel and what your thought was then, what it is now, because early on you were producing content. And if you check out this page, this is just the, you know, the e-commerce community page. You have a sense of humor about you, you have a certain way of uh, copywriting, which I think is fun and funny. Like at the top of this, you could see warning, reading this page will make you want to join e-commerce feel really bad. Right. And so, so I have to interrupt you. I wish I could take, I, okay. I, I feel like this tone does embody because I, I am kind of tongue in cheek. I like to, yeah. I wouldn't call myself a super serious person, but I have to give credit to Leanna Patch over at okay. Touchline Copy for this because she, she was the one who wrote, wrote this copy on this page. Did a great job. The best copywriters in the world Andrew, I think I've interviewed over 120 of some of the top copywriters and direct response marketers. And the best ones get a lot of their material from their client. You know, um, so I bet you said this at some point or, you know, um, not not giving credit to that person. I'm sure they're great. But um, she probably or it's a he listened to you and wrote an amazing, you know, copy for the page. How did you first start? What were you thinking early on with the e-commerce field? What was it going to be and what did you do? Uh, early on, it was, hey, I've got some experience in e-commerce, running these niche e-commerce brands. There's no one talking about this on a kind of a small kind of independent business standpoint. I should try to do something with this knowledge. And, and, and I wasn't sure what. I didn't know if it was selling a course or starting a community or what it was. So the very beginning, I went, to the woods in Arizona in Prescott, Arizona and rented the cabin for two weeks and did nothing but create this like 60 page PDF that I poured literally probably a hundred hours into, um, on how to pick a niche and how to launch an e-commerce business. And, um, cause I knew that if I wanted to do something, I should build an audience first and build connections and network, uh, and build some kind of, uh, presence online. And I figured the best way to do that, the fastest was to create something really valuable and give it away for free. And so create that PDF, put it on the website, started blogging. Uh, people started passing that, that PDF around. It got a lot of traction, actually. It helped build the email list and, and, and build the, the website. And then so I did nothing for the first year except for write content, uh, probably post you know, blogs every other week and tried to spend you know, a meaningful amount of time on those blog posts and shared them. And uh, yeah, and so really just the first year was built on building credibility with no other agenda. And then I launched the community as well as a paid course about a year into it. And over the course of about nine to 12 months, I realized that the community was what I really wanted to focus on. And, and from the get-go, I, I 
I made the decision to try to to have some kind of um, threshold for membership. I think early on it was really low. It was like you know you have to have a business that does fifty thousand dollars per year in sales, and over the years we've bumped that up to a million dollars as a minimum. Um, but I knew that having people with skin in the game that had some level, some threshold of, hey, I've, I've gotten in here, I've wrestled with this, I've solved some of the problems, I have some gumption, uh, would make for a stronger community over the long haul. So um, yeah, that's kind of the early stages and decisions and that kind of grew from there. So The evolution, so were you wanting at that time to go, I'm going to, doing, committing for a year is no joke, Andrew. You know, um, you were talking with Andrew Warner uh, who's a friend and Mixer G and you were saying if you want to get into a you know sudden hit lucrative business model right away building community is not it right it takes Horrible. a lot of time <laughs> and energy before you get traction and so early on were you thinking I want to start a community or I want to do a course on this or because you dedicated a year right before you launched something yeah, definitely. I mean, from the, the get-go, I knew that I I was hoping to be able to monetize it in some way, in a way, assuming I could, you know, add value through that that product. Uh, and I thought about courses. I thought about community. Those were in the back of mind. I just didn't know what, you know, I didn't know if those would be the right the right thing to do. And so I had them in mind, but I hadn't crystallized them fully. Uh, so definitely were there, but but wasn't sure. What was a big turning point with the community? So you start off, you're blogging for a year, you're releasing content, you're building the community. What was a, a point that you're like, okay, um, this created a lot of traction, maybe decision you with the community you mentioned, continuously up leveling the, uh, maybe the type of business caliber of business in it. What were some other decisions you made that really helped you build the community? Uh, I think uh, two answers to that. The first is, uh, there's probably not one that was like this just explosive atom bond moment that, you know, transformed the business. That was really a, you know, kind of like building through a thousand bricks kind of process. Uh, the closest one I can think of is probably having our first live event. So our first live event happened after we'd been, the community had been, you know, live for a year. And there's something that happens when you get people together in person, you know, you, you connect with people and just so deeply, you can't, you, you, you build trust at an exponentially faster rate in person than you do online. Um, and so I think that was a, probably a pretty seminal moment for the community in terms of getting people together in person to connect, to talk. Uh, and it infused a lot of uh, relational glue, if that's a phrase I can use, uh, a lot of trust and rapport. And that was a big one. I think that was our first live event. We've up until this last year, up until 2021, which we're not having an event for obvious reasons, but uh, up until then, we've done them every year, and they've been, yeah, they're a huge, huge part of what makes, I think, our community work and tick and, and uh, yeah, and, and have the trust that it does. You've been doing events for years. What um, structure works the best? You know, as far as, because I know there's speakers and breakouts. What do you find works the best for your community when you have we, the event? Yeah, we've done, we have, especially in the last two or three years, really shifted more to uh, shorter, punchier keynotes, uh, make people, I think even last, even one year we did, I think 15 to 20 minute keynotes. So really making people be concise, deliver a lot of value in a short period of time. Um, as I say this, we're probably, we're at 28 minutes on this, uh, this podcast. So forgive me for being hypocritical. We're but, not a conference. so <laughs> <laughs> People but, can uh, watch us asynchronously. That's right? true. So yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, I think short punchy keynotes, um, and trying to, and breakout sessions, we usually do a combination of keynotes, breakout sessions, kind of choose your own adventure, a smaller discussion-based conference. And, and probably the biggest thing is creating space and moments for people to be able to connect one-on-one -on -one, uh, deeply. So we we try to do a lot of kind of matched networking. So uh, at, at meals or at lunchtime, sometimes you know, we'll definitely kind of seat, seat people together or have like topic-based tables. Um, we'll try to connect people when we can. But I think that's the, we use a mix of all three of those, but I think the most important one is trying to either proactively introduce people or, or get people into the same area so they can introduce each other, connect with each other on, on whatever topic that is, or just leave a lot of space and create environments where people can do that naturally. Because those are the biggest value as you get out of conferences. It's the relationships. I think everyone knows that when they go to conferences. Totally. You know, um, there's a recent episode 
Andrew, that you did um, at the beginning of the year, managing a stressful six months. And in there, you talk about, you know, the ECF capital deal. You talk about running the community, talk about Overlander. Um, so talk about Overlander for a second. Yeah. So Overlander uh, is a site. Overlander.com is, is a site that I uh, was uh, led a team on launching in December, I guess, November. We launched it just before Black Friday. And it was a joint partnership between a company called Auto Anything and then a company called Expedition Overland. And I generally don't work uh, kind of on a consulting basis. I, I never do. I haven't since I launched e-commerce fuel, but uh, I was kind of approached by Drew Sanaki, who is the CEO of Auto Anything. He's a longtime good friend, um, and they were looking to get this, uh, you know, get this site off the ground. Uh, I happen to know also the uh, the owners of Expedition Overland, this crew that uh, of Clay and Rochelle. They've been traveling for you know the last decade all over North America and the planet. And I also love to to travel. I've got this old van I like to travel around in. And so between the people and uh, loving the space and also uh, seeing some opportunities for growth personally and professionally, uh, just from getting my skill set, uh, you know, stretching myself, because uh, we had a pretty big team that was going to be a part of this, probably, you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 people based on how you measure it. Uh, yeah, I decided to do it for six months. And so dove in and we launched it in late November. What was a piece of advice you remember that you gave them that helped move things along or they found helpful? I don't know if it was a piece of advice. My mandate coming in was to really spearhead the project to get it off the ground. So I was responsible for coming up with the brand with the unique selling proposition, helping guide the, uh, the catalog selection, uh, helping kind of think through the marketing uh, and uh, just being responsible for getting it launched on time from a high level. So I, I think maybe, maybe the biggest Again, I, I wasn't giving advice per se as much. I think probably my biggest role was just diving in and getting stuff done and trying to make decisions that moved moved the project forward. Probably the biggest thing that that I think was maybe helpful was just saying like, here's here's what we need to focus on. Here's what the brand needs to be about. Which it's it's a brand that focuses on higher end quality overlanding gear that the that the site can really stand behind. Um, and so I think that was probably the biggest thing from an advice perspective. But yeah, I was more uh, giving advice probably you know wasn't necessarily what I was doing per se. You have some in, you know, some early on industry knowledge of this particular category with one of your brands. So talk about starting that. Yeah. I mean, my first e-commerce business ever was uh, a site called right channel radios that sold CB radios of all things and pick the niche purely, uh, with a mercenary approach to what is profitable, like <laughs> what, where is there a lot of search traffic? Where are the old brands, you know, weak and, and unsophisticated, et cetera. Uh, and so, yeah, I launched that, ran that for eight years, sold that. And um, yeah, that was, so that was kind of my first foray into, into e-commerce. I think that could be a title of your book. Well, I don't know. It really fits your brand, but the mercenary approach. <laughs> that, would, that would be a good title for a blog post. The mercenary or, approach to e-commerce. Or for uh, for one of your podcast episodes, the mercenary approach. Um, and, you know, at the time you did um, drop shipping, right? And how has drop shipping changed as a business it's, model compared to what it was? Because I know you talk openly about one of the brands, you know, uh, drop shipping at the time that whatever it was a uh, 10% margin or whatever it is, what, how has it changed? And I don't know if you had, do you have a, a way to a moat? If someone else finds out what you're selling, do you have a moat or not? Yeah, it's, I mean, drop shipping has gotten exponentially harder since I launched. And I mean, that was, I launched in 2008, that first business, which was a lifetime ago, pretty much a grandpa at this point in the e-commerce world. Um, yeah, it's gotten significantly harder. And this is someone, you know, the Overlander site uh, wasn't entirely drop shipped, but a lot of it was. And and so I think your moat, if you're going to get into drop shipping, you have to have some, you have to, re, have to really be able to answer very well, why are we going to be able to do this any better than the other people that can drop ship these products? And I think the answer is you either have to have way more credibility, you need either need to have exclusive access to something, which you can drop ship items and still have exclusive access. Maybe you negotiate a uh, an exclusive 
uh, distributorship for your country or for your state or something like that. Um, and that can work. Uh, maybe you add just tons more information than other people do, or you have more trust or credibility with Overlander. The reason why, uh, you know, there's a shot at that working well is you've got a lot of credibility from the, the people behind it, uh, the expedition Overland, they've used this stuff. They know this stuff, uh, the creative that they can use and the endorsements and the recommendations they can make come from their own experience. Uh, and they also can bring part of their own audience to that site, which can help. Um, but yeah, it's hard. It's, uh, it's, it's significantly harder than, than reselling stuff that's either private labeled or completely proprietary. But then you also have the hard side of that business. You know, there's hard sides to those businesses as well, but yeah, it's gotten a lot harder. There's advantages and disadvantages, right? But so from the mercenary approach, okay, side, I just like that phrase now. Um, what were some of the products that you sold? Because you've you launched several uh, product companies. One was the CB Radio. What were some of the other ones taking your mercenary approach to e-commerce? What did yes. you, you choose? CB Radios was one. Uh, trolling Motors was was another one. Uh, sold some trolling motors. Why? Parts. Why trolling motors? Again, mercenary approach, totally just keyword based, demand based. Uh, and I felt that one was, yeah, that one didn't work out quite as well on the mercenary front, but the approach going into it was- <laughs> We didn't kill same. anyone with that one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I sold a copious amount of trolling motors before I ever even saw my first trolling motor in person. Like that's how bad it was. Um, so uh, I designed a product. Uh, this was more of just a personal interest and and uh, kind of scratching my own itch, but a, lot, a seat back organizer for for- uh, for especially designed around for off-roading heavy duty off-roading vehicles that could size maps um those were those are the big ones i've been involved with over the years so but yeah mostly the mercenary approach and one of the reasons on the overlander side the two that i wanted to join on that project was to get a sense of how does a project change when you really deeply love uh the project that and the, and the subject area that you're that you're selling and or involved with and so that was kind of interesting being um involved in something that I had much more knowledge and passion about. Are you into off-roading and all this? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've got a, a kind of a, a four by four van, uh, old VW van that, uh, we've taken quite, taken on some fun adventures personally and also as a family. And so it's, uh, it's a space that I know and enjoy a lot. What would you launch today? You're launching a company. It's you, you're, you know, starting a team from scratch, a product from scratch. What, I don't know, maybe niche you would go in? What would you, what would you start doing? That's a good question. In the e-commerce space specifically? or just Yeah, e-commerce space. Yeah. In the e-commerce space? Uh, I've thought about a few things here. I think I would, I would be less concerned about the actual product and I'd be more concerned about the criteria of the product because mm -hmm. it's, and I think one of the biggest things I would focus on is something that has a, a large repeat purchase cycle on it. So mm -hmm. it could be, um, yeah, give me some of the criteria. So it has to be repeat buyer. What else? Yeah, repeat buyer. I think uh, reasonable margins, at least fifty percent plus margins. Um, something that isn't horrendous to ship. Uh, you know, like shipping trolling motors for four or five years. Forget about it. Me. Oh, it's <laughs> anything's easier than that. Oh my goodness! Yeah, it, it's awful. Um, I think those are some of the big ones because I think that I mean, you look at the market today, and you've got three or four companies that probably take up 80% of the web traffic, maybe 90% at this point from a, from a shopping uh, perspective, Amazon, Google, Facebook, um, Instagram, they either control the, the marketplaces or the shopping and, and uh, they're the gatekeepers and just ad costs are going up and up and up and up. And, and so if you, if you're trying, if you're selling a one and done product or a one or two and done, it's, it's really hard to make that work because your acquisition costs are getting so high. So yeah. And then, having higher margins just means you can do so much more. You can play more with pricing. You can spend more on customers, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. So I would look for a product that I felt like I could develop something that fit those kind of those three criteria. So repeat buyer margin and then easy to ship. Yeah. Any genre that you have an affinity to in that, or no. are there any that you'd stay away from? Um, probably consumer electronics. Uh, I, I'd love to add one more product. I would probably try to make it at a minimum your own private label pri line of products. Uh, ideally your own products that you could kind of sell because your, your margins will be better. You don't have to compete against other people. It opens up places like Amazon to you where you don't have to, you know, club off all the other competitors with a, with a bat. <laughs> um, so 
Yeah, I think that'd be another one. I, I would probably stay away from consumer electronics. I actually recently did a, an episode with Adam Lieb, uh, who's who made this incredible uh, typewriter, uh, and he did it from scratch. Wow. Uh, beautiful consumer electronics product. But uh, And I think he would probably do it again, but he also kind of cautioned against what a absolute uh how difficult it is to create consumer electronics because there's so much that goes into it so i probably would stay away from the consumer electronics space any other spaces that you would steer clear of besides consumer electronics i mean it also you know it does create a if you do dive into it it's harder but you do maybe create a, a bit of a moat if other people aren't willing to jump jump through those hoops or walls or whatever are there it's, any it's, other other spaces that you would avoid just because of that i think beverages would be hard um you're shipping them you know you've got inherent complexity with your with, with shipping based on who you're shipping them with they're heavy um you know so high shipping costs um probably you can't charge a ton for them unless yeah. you're selling like 80 year old brandy you know um so yeah that's another one that comes to mind that i probably would be a little little hesitant to get into unless yeah. there was some real compelling reasons otherwise. No, I like that because I mean, if you look at your checklist, right? Repeat buyer, margin, easy to ship, private label. You know, if you think of beverages, check, yes, repeat buyer, totally, right? Margin, no check. Easy to ship, not necessarily a check. I mean, your, margin, um, your margin could be really good. I bet I your margin it. could be really good, but your after shipping margin would be horrific. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean... I remember I was just, um, I bought, I love kombucha and I bought a uh, wild tonic kombucha, this blueberry basil, like just sang to me off the shelf. And, uh, I grabbed it and I'm on my way home. It was delicious. And it was a beautiful glass bottle. And I'm like, this must be so expensive to make. And it was $4 and 20 cents or whatever for the kombucha, which is not on the you know, it's not cheap in general, but it's, as far as kombucha goes. And then I looked on their website because I'm like, oh, I'm going to buy more. Maybe I'll get a bulk discount. And they came out with these slim cans. And I'm like, I knew it. They discovered probably, I don't know. I'm, I actually emailed the founder to have him on. So we'll, I'm going to ask him this question. Did you stop? It's a beautiful bottle, but you're going to these slim cans, right? Is it because it's just way too much? You have to charge more. It's, you know, like you said, it's heavier. There's so many reasons why it probably is not going to do as well and the margin goes down, right? Yeah, I mean, that could definitely be a part of it. Although, if he did it intentionally, it was kind of brilliant because he got you in store, captured you with I the know. beautiful bottle. Like you, exactly. you, your exact words were, it sung to me from the shelf, right? Like, exactly. And brilliant marketing. He got you to the website. Did you end up ordering anymore? Yeah, I call, of course. I yeah. Think, yeah. So yeah. the it, But on their website, the bottles aren't even on there. So... The same reason I bought it, it maybe the same reason they, I mean, they changed it for a different reason, right? But you're exactly right. You know, yeah, it well, got me to see it. But you, you, I would say you bought it the first time, partially because you like kombucha, but also because you noticed it and it was merchandised really well and branded yeah. well in the store. You repurchased it because it was a good quality product. Yeah. Right. So yeah. the packaging after that initial time becomes less important, not, not important at all, but not as critical for getting you in the door the first yeah. time but it almost you because it, it sparked my my thought process andrew because you mentioned like unless you start an 80 year old about uh, 80 year old scotch or whatever and that's kind of what the look it had when it was on the shelf compared to the other bottles right so it had that look so maybe you have the look but you don't have the the uh you know the the that type of product um andrew first of all I have one last question for you, but thank you. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. Thanks for the community that you have led and continue to lead. And I want to tell everyone to check out ecommercefuel.com. Um, I'll pull it up here so people can see if you are watching the video. And you can check out everything that, that Andrew is doing. You could check out, you can see the podcast, the private community, and the e-commerce capital, what he's working on, and much more. So check that out. Last question, Andrew, is about kind of balancing. I was talking with an entrepreneur and he was like, Jeremy, and he has a younger child. Then he said, Jeremy, how do you balance kids hmm. and family and work? And you have three kids. And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> I have two kids. I go, to be honest with you, 
I don't know if I believe in balance per se. Uh, I don't really know the answer to that. I'm still trying to figure that out. So I'm going to ask you, what do you do as a father of three? What is a, a kind of a, a day look like for you? And how do you balance all this stuff? Yeah. A typical day is get up, have breakfast with the kids, usually bike them to school, come into the office, work, uh, head back around probably anywhere from, you know, uh, you know, get back home probably around five, you know, anywhere from three 30 to five, uh, usually, you know, maybe four or five have dinner with the kids for, for a weekday. So that's end the family then. And then they usually go to sleep. So that's a pretty typical day. I think in terms of balance, it's really hard as an entrepreneur to do this. And I think, uh, you're never going to have perfect times of balance. Uh, like, like you alluded to that podcast, the last six months for me was working more than I have in a long time. And I, I still saw my kids a good amount, but there was definitely nights where I was home late or uh, just didn't see them or was, you know, uh, whatever it was, just wasn't around as much. Um, I think in terms of balancing with a family, like you just have to get ruthless. I think the first step is to be proactive about not over committing. Like if you could do one thing, I think to not just completely, ex, you know, absolutely drop an atom bomb on your family life and have a meaningful work life. It's not to overcommit because that's when you get into problems and you, you know, I'm the kind of person who I like to do my absolute best to follow through with commitments that I make. And so once you make them, you can't unmake them. So I think that's step number one. I think step number two is being really ruthless with what you decide to do. I think the last six months for various reasons, I've, I've realized that so much of our success or, or failure or what we do in life is not how hard we work, but what we choose to spend our time on. Uh, and so thinking really deeply about taking on new projects or specifically what you're working on in your business uh, is, is really important. And then all the other stuff people talk about saying no delegation, you know, being efficient, all these kind of things. I think those are, you know, kind of tertiary, but those would be the things I would say. And it's, it's hard. I mean, it's really, it's not impossible, but it's, it's, it's a hard thing to do. You can do it, uh, but it's, it takes a lot of intentionality. Yeah. Everyone. Thank you, Andrew. Everyone check out ecommercefuel.com. Check out other episodes of inspired insider. Check out rise 25. I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.